Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us on this wonderful Tuesday afternoon. We are very excited to welcome you to this webinar event. Uh, artificial, te artificial intelligence technologies have increasingly uh, impacted many aspects of our lives over these last few years, from the kinds of information that we see online to the way that we apply for jobs or the ways we interact with public services. These last few years have seen the UK government begin to develop a roadmap for regulating AI systems. And these last few months have seen public interest in AI systems spike as a result of the launch of powerful systems like ChatGPT. As these technologies become increasingly more essential to our day-to-day -day lives, it's all the more important to understand the expectations and concerns the British public have with them. In November of last year, the Ada Lovelace Institute and the Alan Turing Institute conducted a nationally representative survey of over 4,000 adults in Britain to understand how the public currently experience and understand AI. We're very excited to share the results of this survey with you all today. Um, today, I'm very excited to have a few fantastic guests who are going to be um, speaking with us about these, these results. Um, they are Dr. Helen Margetz, a Turing Fellow and Director of the Public Policy Program at the Alan Turing Institute, and a Professor of Society and the Internet at the University of Oxford. Um, Helen is also a Professorial Fellow at Mansfield College. We're also um, excited to have Dr. Shannon Valor, the Biley Gifford uh, Professor in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Edinburgh. She is also director of the Center for Technomoral Futures in the Edinburgh, Fut Edinburgh Futures Institute. Um, joining us as well is Dr. Gina Neff, the executive director of the Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy at the University of Cambridge, and Ben Lyons, head of external affairs and innovation at the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation. Well, uh, today we have some um, quite a lot of results to get through. We're going to start with a presentation from two of our researchers about the results of the project at a high level. Roshni Monvadia is a researcher in public participation at the Ada Lovis Institute, and Dr. Florence Enick is a research associate in the online safety team with the Alan Turing Institute's public policy program. After this presentation, we'll move into some discussion questions and a moderated uh, discussion with all of the panelists, um, including what these findings may uh, mean for um, policy and regulator, regulatory practices going forward. If you have questions you'd like to ask, we very much welcome you to ask them and to work them in. Uh, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, which you can find. And if you need captions, there's also a show captions function that you can use. I'm very excited to welcome you all to here today, and I'll hand over to Roshni and Florence to lead us off with the opening presentation. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I'm just going to provide a little bit of background to the survey before we show you the main key findings. Um, so firstly, why did we conduct this survey and why now? Um, well, people are coming across artificial intelligence technologies more and more in day-to-day -day life, and these technologies can impact many aspects of people's lives. And there is currently national focus on AI and surrounding policy, and we wanted to understand how the British public are currently experiencing AI. Um, and this is part of a key goal we have at Turing to drive an informed public conversation around AI. Um, so there does already exist um, some work on public attitudes to AI. Um, however, it's been a really difficult topic to ask people, out, people about because AI as a term is really hard to define and is often quite poorly understood. So for this reason, we wanted to ask people about a range of specific AI uses um, that people might come across in different contexts and for a variety of purposes, rather than um, asking about AI as a whole. And as a part of this, we first wanted to find out how aware people are of the wide range of different uses that are um, of AI that are in place and how much experience they might report having with them. Um, existing public attitudes work also tends to ask people about how they feel about AI technologies on a kind of positive to negative, negative type spectrum. And we felt it was really important to allow people to express um, positive and negative sentiment at the same time. So to express how beneficial and how concerning they see various AI technologies to be, um, recognizing that people might see benefits and concerns simultaneously. And we also wanted to understand in greater detail um, the specific ways in which people think uses of AI can be beneficial mm -hmm. and also the key concerns that people have. Mm -hmm. More generally, at this time of national conversation around AI, we also saw the importance of finding out about the public's preferences for governance and regulation, and also how explainable the public would like um, AI decisions to be. 
And given the fast moving nature of this conversation, we wanted to ask um, an up-to-date sample of adults living in Britain. Um, we chose, we wanted a nationally representative sample to ensure inclusivity and also to allow us to make comparisons across key demographic features. So to answer our research questions, we designed a survey which asked people about their attitudes towards and experiences with um, 17 specific uses of AI. And for each use, we asked them how beneficial and how concerning they perceive them to be um, and about the key risks and benefits that they associate with each one. And the 17 uses were chosen um, based on emerging policy priorita priorities um, and increased use in public life. And you can just see the uses that we asked about here. So they were clustered into seven different um, overarching technologies. Um, and these technologies were face recognition, risk and eligibility assessments, targeted advertising online, virtual assistance, robotics and simulations. Um, and we had different examples for each one. And for most of these uses, um, respondents were randomly allocated to, to one, one or two. And following these questions, people asked um, questions also about their preferences for governance, regulation and explainability. Um, so our sample was drawn through Kantar's public voice panel, which is a probability panel, meaning that members of the population are randomly selected and effort is made to ensure that each member of the population has equal chance of being selected. And this ensures a true cross section of the population, which limits the risk of sampling bias. And this is kind of considered the gold standard standard of, of sampling and survey research. Um, we, of course, made sure it was nationally representative across key features. Um, and this included um, a kind of uh, an offline sample of harder to reach participants that were interviewed by telephone as opposed to completing the survey online. Um, and our final sample included over 4,000 people um, nationally representative of Britain. We provide descriptive statistics for the proportions of overall responses for each question in the survey. Um, we use chi-square significance testing to test for meaningful differences between um, groups based on, for example, demographic features like age or gender, and also based on attitudinal features as well. Um, and in the report, we also have some further multivariate regression analyses, which um, allow us to understand predictors of the extent to which people believe benefits that outweigh concerns of some of these technologies. And I'll now pass to Roshni, um, who will talk to us about some of these key findings. Thank you, Florence. Um, so we asked, as Florence mentioned, overall how beneficial people felt each technology to be, and separately how concerning. And we found that for most of the technologies we asked about, people had broadly positive views. You can see from this figure, where green bars show um, the percentage of people that think the technology is either somewhat or very beneficial, that 88% of people felt that the use of AI for predicting cancer risk was beneficial, whereas this figure was only 33% for targeted political advertising. And we found that generally some types of uses of AI were viewed more favorably than others, in particular uses that related to science and education and uses related to security. So for instance, spatial recognition at border control were viewed to be more beneficial, whilst applications in some types of robotics advertising, and even some public sector uses of AI were viewed to be least beneficial. And generally, this pattern followed in overall levels of concerns as well, with over 70% of people feeling either somewhat or very concerned about the use of autonomous weapons, and similarly for driverless cars as well. On top of this, around 60% of the public were concerned about targeted online advertising, as well as the use of AI in recruitment. And although uses in science, such as to determine the risk of cancer, were viewed favorably, around half of the public expressed concerns about the use of AI in healthcare. And we actually found that 55% of people felt virtual healthcare assistance, so things like potentially healthcare chatbots, were concerning, and 48% felt the same about robotic care assistance. And when we looked at overall benefit scores for each technology alongside overall concern, we found that for 11 of the 17 technologies we asked about, um, perceived benefit actually outweighed concern, suggesting broad positivity for some uses of AI. However, this broad positivity is not the complete picture, and there's a lot of nuance in attitudes when you look more closely at the data. Regardless of how they responded in terms of how beneficial or concerning they perceived each technology to be overall, 
All participants were able to select any specific benefits they thought related to that technology, and similarly, any specific concerns. And this was from a pre-selected list of potential benefits and concerns, and they could choose as many options as they thought were applied. They could give um, an alternative response and an open-ended response. They could say they didn't know or even select none of these as an option. And we found that there are some very specific advantages and disadvantages people see in relation to nearly all of the AI technologies we asked about, regardless of how concerning or beneficial the technology was perceived to be overall. So here we have the examples of AI for detect detecting cancer and facial recognition and border control, which were the two technologies perceived to be most beneficial out of all of the ones we asked about. But even still, we can see here that half of the public uh, said they were concerned about relying too heavily on this technology over um, the judgment of professionals for cancer risk prediction. And 47% were concerned about what this technology meant for accountability for mistakes. But kind of where would responsibility lie if um, it made an incorrect judgment? And similarly, for facial recognition at border control, people were concerned about accountability again. Um, but on top of this, also uh, concerns around job cuts and the reliability of these tools came up. And driverless cars and autonomous weapons were the two technologies that people were most concerned about. And even still, interestingly, 63% of people felt a benefit for driverless cars could be improved accessibility for disabled people or those who may find driving difficult, difficult. And for autonomous weapons, over half said preservation of soldiers' lives could be a benefit. And more generally, when we looked at the range of benefits and concerns that were commonly chosen across all technologies, we found that people often felt speed, efficiency, and making things fairer and more accessible were key benefits of many AI applications, whilst the loss of human judgment, accountability for mistakes, and transparency and decision-making were key concerns. We ended our survey with some more general questions about regulation and governance of AI, as well as opinions on whether an explanation should accompany AI-made decisions. And we found overall that the public want regulation and they value these explanations. When asked what would make them more comfortable with the use of AI, 62% of people said laws and regulation, and 59% said clear procedures in place to appeal AI decisions. And in terms of governance and who should regulate, an independent regulator was the most popular option selected. And kind of both of these findings together suggest a desire for avenues to appeal decisions made by AI and broadly for regulation of these tools. Finally, when presented with various statements, that make trade-offs between having an explanation on how an AI system reached a decision or having an accurate decision from that system, we found that the public value explanations. Most people believe humans should ultimately make decisions and be able to explain them, but this was followed by AI either sometimes or always providing an explanation, even if it reduces the accuracy of that decision. And only 10% of people said accuracy is more important than providing an explanation. And this preference for an explanation aligns with some of the specific concerns we found earlier in the survey, which were around transparency of decision making and accountability for mistakes, highlighting a general reluctance to blindly defer to AI made decisions. And so to conclude, we'd like to acknowledge um, the colleagues that contributed to this project. It was a huge collaborative effort between both the Allen Turing Institute and the Ada Lovelace Institute, as well as LSE's methodology department. Um, and we're very thankful to our funders as well. So both the Alan Turing Institute and the Humanities Research Council for making this project possible. And taken together, we feel that the findings from this um, project have implications for policymakers and developers alike. And we're really keen to hear your thoughts. So with that, I'll hand back to Andrew. Thanks so much, Roshni. I've saw lots of exciting and fascinating findings there for us to discuss. I'm really excited to welcome in our panel, uh, um, Helen, Gina, Shannon, and Ben. Um, Helen, I thought we'd start with you just if, if for each panel to kind of give about three minutes or so of their initial thoughts or in, in response to these findings. And, and Helen, I'm curious if you want to start us off with kind of what you think your sort of the big um, surprising, most interesting findings were from this uh, this survey. Hello. Hello. Um, thanks, Andrew. I mean, I, I guess, I, I guess three things that I think are 
are really notable here. I mean, one Florence mentioned at the beginning, we wanted to, we wanted not to ask about sort of the general um, uh, AI in the general sense, because um, we, we do feel that that's a very difficult thing to either define or understand. We wanted to ask how people experience these technologies in daily life with which they are already um, intertwined. And the point about AI is it's a, it's a kind of horizontal technology. It gets into everything, but the implications are also vertical. It has different implications and different effects in, in, in different contexts with different uses and in different sectors. And I think this has shown that um, uh, uh, really, re really clearly, um, the kind of value of asking about it and really showing that people have very nuanced, I wasn't surprised by this, because I think you always find um, uh, this out when you do public um, engagement work, but you, you know, finding out that people have nuanced and sophisticated views about these technologies, they can be positive and, you know, the positive findings that was that for the majority of the technologies, people were um, positive about them for the majority of the uses that we asked about. But being able to have those positive uses while maintaining a variety of concerns, I think that's something really um, important to come out of it. Um, of course, the point about regulation is important as well. I mean, it, it, this is where the national conversation is at the moment, and it is really important to understand um, what people want out of regulation. Um, and I think those findings will be very important going, going forward. Thanks. Thanks so much, Helen. Yeah, I, I think some, some really good points about that kind of nuance of these findings and, and um, about the, the challenges of, of, of uh, not moving beyond the sort of general definition of AI. Um, Shannon, I'll, I'll hand to you now for your initial thoughts and kind of any interesting or immediate sort of um, uh, surprising findings that jumped out to you. Oh, sorry, Shannon, you might be muted. You would think three years in, uh, we would be figuring out how to do this. Um, thanks, Andrew. I, I'm really excited to, um, to to dig into this in the conversation. And um, I'll start just by mentioning a couple of things that I found really interesting and made me have further questions, as these surveys often do, right, where we, we get a piece of information and then um, that leads us to an even deeper question that we want to ask. So one is, um, where are the public's learning about AI. So we're understanding uh, the uh, level of familiarity they think they have and the extent to which it's based in personal experience. But if it's not from personal experience, um, where who are they listening to? Um, and this is particularly urgent considering the latest hype cycle around chat GPT and how much uh, distortion uh, of the reality of the technology has been present in some media outlets and in some uh, sort of social media discourses. Uh, so, uh, so one question is, you know, how well informed, how authoritative are the perspectives on the AI that the public uh, is uh, is getting? A second question, I think, is um, the difference between younger and older generations, especially with their um, question, their answers to the question of who's responsible or who should be responsible uh, for governing these technologies. Um, I wonder if that reflects a difference in, you know, younger generations' faith in institutions, um, and whether we might uh, then have to have to grapple with that. But the thing I want to talk about uh, most, I think, is the um, that what might seem to be a surprising result about the favoring of explanations over accuracy, but actually, uh, it lines up quite well with some of the intuitions that uh, many of us have and and work that I've been doing on. Uh, answerability as a way of thinking about responsibility in trustworthy autonomous systems. So we have a, a, a project that's working on that. And one of the things that's really interesting about that is that if, if you if you see this as irrational, right, um, then you might be missing something. That is, if you think it's irrational to care more about the explanation uh, of a less accurate system and favor that than a system that's more accurate but can't explain itself, um, I think what you're missing is the importance of the trust relation uh, when we are vulnerable to something that has us in its power or has the power to uh, harm us or help us. And uh, there's a, a clue, I think, in the results where uh, there was a great concern about the loss of professional judgment. 
And I think we might focus on the word judgment naturally, but actually I think it's the word professional that we need to focus on. Because what do professionals do? Um, they profess certain, it's rooted in uh, the, the word to profess, to profess a vow uh, to others. And so professionals are people who profess vows or, or duties to those who they serve, to those who they help. Uh, and these are vows to use their knowledge and power responsibly and in ways that vulnerable others can trust, right? So a professional uh, is someone who you can trust to uh, slice into your brain if you have a tumor, right? A professional is someone you can trust with your money if they're a professional financial advisor. And I think one of the things we just need to understand is that the reason I think for this favoring of explanation, even if accuracy is, is, uh, uh, is, is not as high, is that we want to know that there's someone on the other side who understands our vulnerabilities to this system and is willing to assume certain responsibilities and profess certain duties to us uh, in this interaction. And I think that's what we're missing uh, so far with AI and autonomous systems, because we don't have that accountability uh, or that answerability to, uh, to these systems and their power. The very very good point about about that the the emphasis in that word professional, um, which which uh, I think yeah comes across quite clearly in a lot of the answers to these uh, to the, the technologies we asked about. Thanks you thanks so much, Shannon. Um, ben, I'll hand over to you now as someone who's um, done some public attitudes research yourself at CDI. I would love to hear your thoughts on on the results of the survey. Thanks, Andrew. And it's a um, it's a really important and timely piece of piece of research. Um, I was asked yesterday by someone what do the public think about AI and the um, you know, frustrating but honest answer is that it depends and um, I think you know the, the, the focus in this research on use cases and really diving deep into different use cases is really beneficial and important I think you know in particular I thought some of the interesting nuances that came out of this research are the suggestion that um, the public may see particular benefit in situations where AI enhances human decision making, uh, as opposed to to replacing human decision making, um, and and I think also the the idea around the kind of the the net benefit school. So I think I think is a is a helpful way of of looking at the extent to which you know there are there are meaningful trade offs which can be sometimes lost from just kind of overall positive positive negative type type questions and i think you know striking to see that you know for example using ai to assess the risk of cancer uh was something that people were you know saw, saw as broadly positive with, with lower levels of concern but but interesting you know but also but also um for people with with concerns about where things could go could go wrong. Um, I think um, I'd also suggest, you know, the kind of concern is closely related to where there is easily identifiable potential benefit or harm to individuals, where things can go wrong, where and and, and where with limited human oversight or challenge or or ability to understand the role of AI in decision making processes, um, there can be significant um, concern. And I think in our research, often the what sometimes comes through is 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 a focus on the the role of the actor as well that's using AI as a bit of a proxy for for what is the intent and do I trust do I trust the system that the, the AI is being used uh, within? Um, I guess also kind of struck that um, you know the concerns and one of the things that's really helpful here to come through is is that the concerns are very different based on different use cases. So striking to see on you know, targeted advertising, for example, privacy is a top concern on driverless cars, reliability, safety are, are big concerns in, in other in, in decisions about individual, it's things like accountability and contestability. So I think it's really helpful to have, have that nuance on, on if there are, you know, a number of principles which are important across the piece in terms of how we think about AI governance, um, the importance of different principles do, does, does vary on a, uh, on, on, a, on a contextual basis and then what that means varies people. Um, well, I think going forward, it'd be really interesting to see how these attitudes change based more on personal experience, right? So, you know, to take that context, you know, targeted advertising is something that people see in their day-to-day -day lives, driverless cars, people read about in the media, 
um, but don't necessarily use themselves. Um, uh, and you know, and, and at CDI, so we're, we're working within the Department for Science, Innovation, Technology, we'll you know we'll be looking really closely at these findings to inform our work on on AI assurance um, uh, and as for how we build a strong platform of of tools to trust with the AI and we will be focusing on some of the use cases which come through in this work including work on connected and automated vehicles and HR and recruitment and we'll be sharing more on that um, very soon. Um, Thanks so much, Ben. Yeah, some really fantastic points there. I think that notion of sort of who is behind a technology is a um, very much an important factor that we, we covered as well in, in this uh, in the survey. Um, and um, I think at that point about sort of this being a longitudinal study, how these how these attitudes may change over time is an excellent one. I can see some questions as well from the the um, audience about sort of how some of these technologies were chosen. The main one of the main reasons we chose some of these technologies was in partly due to policy windows or uh, media focused attention on these technologies as they're being covered. So we very much hope this will be something we can look at longitudinally, see how these change over time. Um, I can see that Gina uh, is is uh, our, our last um, person to give some initial thoughts about this before we move to a Q&A. I can see those in the audience have already started to add to the Q&A list, but please continue to do so. I will work um, those in. Gina, I'm curious for your thoughts on any kind of, of, of the major top interesting findings that stuck out to you in reading the report. Well, first, compliments to the entire team for the hard work that went into this great report. It's incredibly useful. The timing is... Um, apt, and it gives us something to base on, um, base the conversations on. I, I think for me, one of the things that's very striking is the very large gap that we have between the risks that people perceive about AI between experts, between um, a survey, and between the news conversation that we have. And one thing that I think will be incredibly useful um, for this report to do is help point to where we are in different points of those different conversations, where experts are worried about particular concerns from machine learning, artificial intelligence te technologies, um, what trickles into public conversation and public understanding, and then how news conversations may be changing or shaping that. I think I think keeping those three. Um, in mind, help us design better ways to raise awareness around different sets of concerns that we want to do. And, and I think the best way to point to that is something that's in the report is really a gap between today's fact and science fiction. So driverless cars, we have a lot talking about driverless cars in, in, in the news, but we don't so much have a conversation about, say, facial recognition technology is being used by London Metropolitan Police. Um, we have a lot of conversation in the news about some of these cases, um, but, but the kind of everyday machine learning algorithms that people are using aren't necessarily ones that they're, they're, they're worried about or concerned about, even though they have, experts have enormous concerns through the questions of bias, fairness, accountability, accuracy. So this report really is to be commended by um, disentangling some of those. And it points to, I mean, what I find really interesting, it points to how um, those perceptions around, say, driverless cars are dominating the perceptions that people, people have. Um, I'll point to, you know, one of the questions asked about virtual reality and education, for example, but how um, data are being processed in schools already through the use of third party apps that are commonplace in British schools. Um, you know, that's a that's a concern that it would take a long time to explain in a survey. And it's something that many parents would have um, uh, 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 experience with, but seeing it as AI is not necessarily something that people do because they're not thinking of um, the whole smartphone, tablet, uh, PC array as being something that that dr is driven by these technologies. And then third, and I would say um, importantly, is you know this survey marks a moment in time before the conversation shifted to chat GPT. And what I find interesting that we're having the national conversation now about generative AI 
is exactly what Shannon just said about the professional, right? The middle class and professional worries around what tasks will be replaced have really driven um, a news agenda in the last six weeks. And it's something that certainly is concerning to government, to policymakers, to civil society organizations. And, and I think what we have here is a, is a, is a great um, capture of how people are imagining what AI will be used for and done before generative AI becomes something that that is commonplace understanding in, in, the, in the news cycle. So that perception, I think, is useful to hold on to and will be very useful to go back to in 6, 12, 18 months time to see where, where, where people are. Overall, I would say this um, report is to be commended. Um, it's, it is incredibly useful to have the understanding of where people are worried and where they are not worried. It also shows the work that we have to do around responsible um, artificial intelligence technologies and, and how we create national conversations about what risks we're willing to bear and what regulations in what use cases, in what scenarios we're willing, you know, we need to, to, to get in place. And so that is, um, um, going into the conversations that we'll be having over the next uh, week through London Tech Week and, and all the AI events and announcements that will be made then are incredibly important to help show um, that we've got a, a strong factual basis to have those conversations on. Thank you so much, Gina. I, I think some some really fascinating points, and just um, just I think one thing that I'm hearing a couple of panelists and quite a lot of the of the questions in the audience I'm sort of touching on is um, what if anything has changed uh, since ChatGPT has been launched, and and where what is shaping public opinions? How might um, a survey that is done in November of 2022 differ from a, a survey that's done in November of 2023? Um, Helen, Shannon, I, I wonder if I could start with you um, about this question. I'm curious, Helen, if you could start us off. What do you think might be different in in, a, in six months' time if we were to run the survey again um, in light of the last six months of sort of the generative AI madness, so to speak? Well, thanks. Yeah, and I I, I liked it that Gina said that because in some ways, I'm, I mean, at first it seemed, oh, no, we missed chat GPT. But I mean, it wouldn't have been a good time to ask about it in this kind of, you, you know, this really peaking um, hype cycle. I really think we, we do have to wait a bit until, you know, people have domesticated it because the uses we asked about have are in some sense domesticated, even if they don't know that they're AI. And Gina made a good point there. I mean, in, you know, a lot of AI, I don't know, Google Translate, it's very sophisticated AI, but people don't necessarily recognize it as AI. Um, so it's good that we weren't just asking people about GPT. I think your question, though, really does reinforce the importance of keeping the conversation going. I mean, a survey is great, but it's a sort of, and I, I'm so happy that we have this sort of baseline. And I should say to everyone on the call, actually, you know, this the data here, we're releasing the data and it will be a complete treasure trove for people to delve down into some of these issues. I mean, I noticed somebody asked about facial recognition technology and where, why weren't people so worried about them? Well, in, you know, it may be that they don't know very much about about them they don't know so much about what the concerns might be and so on and that might be a really important indicator for the public um, conversation um, so there's lots to do some of that can be done by analyzing the data but you know if, if, in six months time I hope that we would be doing more things for instance I know that all the organizations represented on this call and I'm sure many organizations in the audience I can see the ICO there for example are involved in all sorts of citizen engagement work. I mean, the science of citizen involvement has really moved on. So there are things like citizens, juries. I think we will be using ChatGPT itself to ask people what they think about the latest generation of AI technologies. There's all sorts of ways which it will be uh, really helpful. So, you know, I think we've got to keep at it, as it were. This has to be a continual stream of um, engagement rather than, rather than a once-off. Thanks so much, Helen. I, I'm Shannon. I'm, I'm curious for your views as well. I'm responding to that. I mean, um, it does seem like uh, quite a lot has changed. I'm curious how you might anticipate these findings to reflect that in, uh, in, a, in a future version of the survey. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. But I agree with Helen that uh, I actually think it's ideal that um, the, the survey was taken before 
uh, this uh, latest uh, round of of, of kind of uh, AI hype and confusion, because I think that would be reflected if you did uh, the survey right now in in what you saw. That is, you would you would see uh, you would see fear, you would see uncertainty, you would see confusion, um, and 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 you know public attitudes uh, are really um, most valuable when they're relatively informed, uh, relatively as uh, Helen has suggested. Um, based on a, a version of the technology uh, that uh, ha has begun to settle uh, into the fabric of daily life. And so we have a sense of uh, how it might possibly affect us or, or, or change us or organizations or institutions. And the current environment is just uh, not conducive, right, to that kind of informed perspective. It's conducive to confusion, uncertainty, I do think it will be interesting uh, in perhaps a year's time to see what has happened, particularly around two issues with ChatGPT that, that we know about early on. Uh, one, of course, being the um, uh, perpetuation uh, of uh, false or erroneous uh, content that leaks its way into uh, authoritative settings, right? Uh, there's a lot of worry about the pollution of trusted sources by chat GPT. And if we don't get a handle on that very quickly, uh, I think a, a year from now, uh, public attitudes around AI are gonna be profoundly affected by that, right? Uh, the whole point of AI, if it has any point, right? Uh, is to provide some additional uh, kind of cognitive strengths to the human social environment. And if it's draining uh, our ability to track truth, if it's, uh, muddying the waters between expert perspectives and um, fiction, uh, then it doesn't fulfill the the function that's implied by its name. So, so I think there's a sort of critical moment we have here to figure out whether uh, we're going to uh, address those uh, those risks. And the other thing that will be interesting is people's attitudes about um, the copyright copyright issues and the uh, the the ownership of creative labor uh, and the compensation of human creative labor uh, and the fair treatment of that labor. Um, because I think right now there's a lot of uh, anger brewing in, in many uh, parts of uh, the community about that. Uh, and again, it remains to be seen whether this is uh, uh, an issue that as Helen says, we can domesticate in some way uh, that is kind of return uh, to a uh, an equilibrium that is broadly acceptable uh, to uh, to uh, the, the wider communities who are impacted by this, uh, or whether we're we're going to to fail in that domestication, right? And and public attitudes will be very different depending upon what turns out to be the case. So uh, so yeah, I think maybe in a year's time we we want to know. Hoping for a more positive uh, <laughs> um, sort of outcome in, in that time, but yeah, I think very, very excellent points about the, particularly about the expectations that are, are currently underway. Um, ben, I, I want to turn to you and ask a question about um, really drawing again from some of the questions the audience are asking about how this survey results um, compare to previous and other surveys that you've you've done at CDI. And I think there's a particular question here around trust that I think comes up in this survey. That I, I was curious. I'm aware there's something that, that your team have also looked at this notion of, of trust in these kinds of systems. I'm, I'm just curious, sort of how, how do you think these findings are in any way um, challenging or changing uh, um, what previous surveys have have shown? And um, yeah, a bit more sort of about how you how your team are constructing or understanding uh, public trust in these systems. Yeah, I mean, I mean so I'll make a couple of points. I mean, I mean, I think I think firstly, you know, one one of the things I think is really helpful is the delineation between headline findings towards the term AI and the nuances of different views that come that, that come through when you when you're looking at different use cases. You know, so for example, we we run a regular tracker survey into public attitudes towards data and AI, and we are about to start work on the the third wave of this of this tracker survey, and would encourage people on the call who want to feed in thoughts and questions to to, to get in touch. But um, but we one of the questions we ask is a big is a big kind of use one word to describe to describe what you think about AI and scary is a word that comes up um, quite quite a lot um, and quite and quite and quite you know and quite and quite large um, 
the when when people look at the at the use cases um, for AI, uh, and, and, and both both in practice and uh, and potential use cases, we tend to find, as you've seen in this research, um, higher levels of support for a number of of mainstream or likely likely use cases, and on balance, a sense that when people consider a number of a number of um, use cases that the perceived benefits for those for those use cases might might tend to outweigh out, outweigh the risks. Um, that means, you know, and, and and so I think I think drawing out that distinction between um, the term AI and the applications is is um, is really helpful here. Um, I think I think one I think one one of, one of the areas where perhaps um, I think the jury jury might be might be out is on the um on the on the explainability accuracy um point so I've, I've, I've seen i've seen a range of research which which points more in the more in the side of of, of accuracy being being important um and um and some research which looks across different sectors and some which is i think in particular focused on on healthcare and so i think i think that I think there's a range of evidence at the moment which which points in slightly in slightly different ways on that, and I think and I think that it will, I think re other research I've seen I've seen kind of tends to suggest that it you know that there is a quite close relationship between between context again there in terms of in terms of where accuracy is most highly valued and where and where explainability um, is um, is important to people. Um, I think one other point I make is is that. Um, it's, stri it's striking, you know, as, 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 as others mentioned, you know, this is this is this is kind of perhaps you know the, the last the last piece or the last one of the last big pieces of research before AI uh, was a widely understood, widely recognised um, term in the UK, and you know, and, and often um, you know when we've done public engagement, people have heard the term, but actually um, they Kind of might know it's something to do with computers, or people might link it to cookies, or to, um, or, 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 or perhaps to slightly more kind of science fiction um, scenarios. But people don't necessarily feel able to define AI. Um, and I think what we're going to see um, over the coming year is people defining AI much more closely based on their experience of ChatGPT, um, which is, you know, clearly one. You know, um, like a, you know that that sort of chatbot LLM is one is one significant um, application of AI, but it is it is just one application. And so I think it will be interesting also in future research to ensure that people can consider the variety of ways in which AI um, can be used and be aware that you know things in the future are going to be very very highly framed, both based on consumer experience with ChatGPT, but also as we see in the adoption of technologies, um, which sectors adopt uh, AI most quickly and most effectively, and and perceptions of the impacts of that adoption of AI as it as it stops being something that is purely theoretical and 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 and, and, and understood either through you know something that is that is kind of experienced by people. Been a really important thing to, uh, to, 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 to monitor. Thanks so much, Ben. I, I, it's interesting that point about accuracy. Um, <laughs> I think it, anyone, <laughs> any machine learning researcher in the room might be sort of um, uh, wringing their hands about um, accuracy being the most important one instead of precision or recall. But uh, it's a it's a fascinating point. So I think one for for more qualitative um, uh, study after uh, or in, in future research. Gina, I want to turn to you. Um, there's a lot of questions in the chat uh, proposing different governance uh, proposals. And one of the findings from this, this survey was this, this notion that people really do want regulation. There's some interesting demographic differences, as Shannon pointed out, um, between mm -hmm. what people seem to want. But there's there's also so many governance and, and regulatory proposals being announced right now, from moratoriums, the um, focus on intellectual property rights, um, a bill of rights like the U.S. is proposing the kind of context uh, sector-specific approach that the UK's white paper on AI regulation is taking to the risk-based approach in the EU. 
I'm curious, sort of, what do you, what do you, sort of, from these findings, is there any kind of um, oversight or insight you might have about uh, what the the findings might mean for a policymaker who's finding himself in this position of trying to figure out how to govern these types of technologies? I think the strongest takeaway from this report is we have to think about AI in specific, concrete use cases. Um, the the idea of using this poorly constructed term AI to blanket over a lot of different technologies, a lot of different um, uh, methods um, underlying a lot of different activities and a lot of different situations is 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 a is a difficult one to get your head around anyway. And to 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 you to do that for regulation is not likely to be successful. So what this report really shows is that people have different perceptions of what is useful to them, what is risky to them. Um, and those perceptions are, um, I think, very smartly crafted in this report through those use cases. Now, that said, there are big use cases that weren't in this report for, I'm sure, really good reasons. You can't ask about everything. But for example, um, you know, people are already experiencing AI in entertainment recommendations for, for what they watch on streaming services is already something that's driven by um, algorithmic um, decision making. That's a case that I think most people, I suspect, would um, uh, hold as not particularly risky to them. If you get a bad Netflix recommendation or a bad Amazon recommendation, it's not going to harm. But, you know, asking whether or not someone um, approves of facial recognition technologies being used by the police might differ depending on the perception that people have of those um, technologies are helping to make policing fairer or make policing more biased. And that will, I would assume, change depending on people's attitudes toward the police. So I think there's a, a lot of subtlety that we still need to do around how we have conversations about regulation. I think a policymaker today picking up this report should um, um, first be grateful that there's some, some sense cutting through a whole lot of hype that is out there right now. And, um, and let me again make one more plug that the, that the report focuses on these real everyday, I like Helen and Shannon have used the word domesticated, these real everyday interactions that people have, rather than the very far out, far fetched science fiction um, kinds of concerns that we're hearing around the moratorium letters and the, um, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like its own hype cycle. We, we have a cover, a convenient cover is happening now of future far out risks rather than the conversations we really need to be having about the everyday right here, right now risks of artificial intelligence technologies and systems. And so what this reports to be applauded for is it helps us anchor those conversations about governance in something that's real and here rather than something that's imagined and out there. Really, really brilliant points. I, I, th I think, uh, uh, Helen, if I may, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the same question of sort of lessons to be learned here for policymakers and and uh, those working on AI regulation right now. Absolutely. And um, I, yes, I, I, I very much uh, agree with Gina. I mean, of course, of course, the UK has gone down this sector specific route um, for regulation, which, you know, in many ways is exciting. There's a real chance here to show it can work. And as the report shows very clearly, and as we've all said, I think, you know, uh, it's having different implications in different sectors. So there's different implications for different regulators. I mean, one of the things I would like to see is this kind of, this kind of way of, of, of measuring pu public attitudes, but also the other ways that we've talked about, you know, actually being used by regulators. You've got a kind of clear message here about what people think would make them feel more comfortable with certain Te te with technologies um, and you know we have seen for example uh, the Turing with the um, ICO um, produce the uh, uh, project explain the ICO's explainability guidance was a, a co-badge guidance and 
that's what I really want to see. I want to see kind of insights from reports like this, and of course, other other other, other reports, um, actually feeding in to the design, the development, and the deployment, and the regulation of these technologies. I, th I think that's what 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 we would all hope for. Excellent points, I, Shannon. I, I kind of want to twist this question slightly. Um, you know, I think right now we're seeing a lot of calls for industry self-regulation again. It's almost like we're we're living through uh, 2012 all over again. Um, you know, calls for moratorium, calls for self, um, sort of voluntary governance practices. And I, I think it was, it was as you mentioned in your opening remarks. It's fascinating to see this kind of um, uh, generational difference in what some young people are expecting. I'm curious if if the survey suggests any findings that that might um, shape or or, or um, influence practitioners of uh, who are developing or deploying AI systems going forward. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'll come back to this question of accountability and human judgment. Um, and uh, professional judgment, uh, certainly, but um, but broadly speaking, I think one of the things that it uh, tells practitioners is that um, people really don't want uh, their minds to be uh, replaced or um, uh, made obsolete. Uh, and the nature of human judgment is arguably a, a value in and of itself, not just because of the accurate results uh, that it reaches in solving certain kinds of problems or puzzles, right? Uh, that human judgment is a capability that in and of itself, we have a reason to want to exercise, uh, to cultivate and, and retain and strengthen. And so uh, I think often I, I see for people in the responsible AI space, uh, there's a very clear focus on issues like fairness, transparency, safety, uh, and, and those are all quite important. But often there's a, a sort of techno solutionist turn where the assumption is if the machine can do a thing, then it should do a thing instead of a human doing that thing, uh, which loses the question of what are the things that humans have an intrinsic uh, need to be doing uh, or right to be doing? Uh, and, and where can we make sure that new technologies support those capabilities and enhance our capacity to exercise uh, those activities or those capabilities, as opposed to uh, coming in and changing the incentives in the in the economy or in the political system, such that we can no longer freely or or broadly exercise those capabilities, uh, and and that's what we we worry about. For example, in the creative sector, with the incentives for creative labor going away as a result of uh, an unplanned intrusion of uh, technologies into that sector uh, that was not uh, uh, set up to specifically enhance and enrich human creative labor, uh, but uh, in many cases is already being used to automate and replace it. So we don't have to use it that way, right? But we need to change. It's not going to automatically be used in such a way that humans aren't replaced. That has to be a choice. That has to be a deliberate question for uh, policymakers, but also for designers. and what they have in mind when they build a tool, right? Uh, whether they're making it easier to substitute uh, uh, this for a human uh, or to uh, empower a human uh, with the tool. Uh, and then the final thing I'll just say, uh, because you mentioned, Andrew, this is not our first rodeo. Those of us who've been working in the kind of tech ethics field, uh, uh, this, is, this is maybe our third or fourth rodeo, uh, if not with AI, right, with social media or, um, it, 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 the smartphones, it's, it's, we, we've, we've run this sort of hype regulation, um, harm domestication, uh, cycle many times. And I think what, uh, regulators and policymakers really need to learn from this, um, is that incentives, uh, are the most important, uh, lever that they have for, uh, shaping a responsible AI ecosystem. And talking about the goals of the ecosystem is all fine and good. And you know, the current AI regulation is identifying the right high level principles. But the question is, do you have the incentives in the ecosystem properly arranged to reinforce the organizations and actors in that ecosystem to achieve that goal of responsible AI? Uh, we didn't have those incentives in place for social media platforms, right? We had counter incentives where in fact, companies who wanted to do the right thing uh, had uh, commercial and legal barriers to doing so. 
Uh, they might get sued by their stakeholders, right? If they made a certain choice uh, that favored the public interest over their stakeholders' interests. Um, we need to make sure that the incentives are different this time. Uh, and um, uh, and I, I hope that, that policymakers can look at the desire for accountability in this survey and say, we need to deliver that this time, right? Um, we can't just make the same mistakes over and over again. This time, let's lead with accountability and let's make the sure that the incentives for everyone are there because in the end, that benefits innovation. Innovation gets better. People are more ready to adopt it. Uh, there's less fear. There's less uncertainty. Uh, there's more trust. Uh, but you, you can't get that for free. You have to get that through this kind of smart policy and regulation that strengthens innovation by strengthening accountability. Brilliant points. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, we have about two minutes left of time. So I'm going to ask each panelist if they can just end us with um, one question that they would like to see in a future survey on public attitudes to AI. Um, ben, I'll start with you. Um, and if we could keep these questions, these answers quite short, because we, uh, we do have a hard stop at the hour. I think um, understanding um, what where where people believe they've experienced AI and understanding and understanding not just not just the kind of the the attitude towards um, towards potential examples but but understanding the differences perhaps between um, perceived perceived use cases and and, um, and 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 future use cases and behavior and attitudes on use cases that people have experienced will be, will be a really important area of research for future research. Excellent point. Uh, Gina? Like a qualitative researcher, I'm going to ask three, but I'm thinking like a, like a survey because it can't be in depth. Um, do you think AI will impact your job? To what tasks do you think AI will impact at your job? And how likely do you think that is to happen? Excellent questions. Um, all, all very job oriented, um, an exciting area. Shannon, I'll, I'll hand to you next. Yeah, I, I think it would be really uh, interesting to learn more about uh, what respondents mean uh, when uh, they say they want explanations or they say they want accountability, because we know those mean many different things in different contexts. And often people might say they want an explanation if that's the choice they're given, but what they might be asking for is not an explanation, right? But a justification or some other kind of promise or, or, uh, or answers. So that's one thing that we might uh, be able to use a survey to learn more about. Um, and, a, and another thing is uh, to have people think bigger than just what's being presented to them and ask what kinds of problems would you like AI to help you or, or your community solve? Or, or, or if not solve, um, uh, at least tackle more effectively, right? Um, in, instead of saying, here's a technology, find a good use for it. Um, I, I, I hope we can get back to this question of what are the fundamental human needs? What are, where are the things that we're lacking? Um, and how can new technologies help us um, uh, kind of be fuller and, um, uh, and, and flourish more, uh, uh, more broadly? And I think people are pretty good at figuring out what are the problems in their life that we don't seem to have the resources to solve uh, or where there might be some way that technology could uh, assist us. And I'd like to see more information about that be gathered. Brilliant. Uh, Helen, I will uh, have the, leave you with the final word. Thank you very much. Well, I was going to be really boring and saying, well, we must ask these questions again. So we've got a point of a comparison. Um, and I think we should do that, but we have to be careful because as, as surveys can become very, they can become very sort of stultified by that kind of approach. I agree with Shannon, really. I mean, I, I think really delving into some of the questions and even some of the ones we haven't talked about here, like the who produces um, these technologies, does it matter to you? You know, the kind of developers and the producers of these te technologies. And, and perhaps going back to something I take, take back earlier, uh, mentioned earlier, actually using some of these technologies to delve in in a sort of free form way, which is something that I think large language models are going to be um, uh, really exciting for with appropriate guardrails, of course. 
crucially, if those appropriate guardrails. Well, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us today. I'm afraid that is all the time that we have. A massive thanks to all of our panelists and for our research team. Special thanks to Patrick Sturgis, Oriol Bashover, and Katja Kostadincheva at the London School of Economics. Thanks to the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Alan Turing Institute for their funding to support this project and to Kantar for their incredible work delivering it. Um, and thank you, all of you, for joining us for this discussion. We hope this is the start of many, many more discussions on these attitudes to come. Have a lovely rest of the day and take care, everyone.